Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone. In this video we are going to be talking about correlation. So statistically when we are measuring correlation we calculate what's called the correlation coefficient. And this gives me a measure of the strength of the association or the relationship between two metric variables. One of the common areas that we are going to use this for is looking at uh, relationships between scale items and also between our scales and between our metric variables. So when we have a metric, a demographic metric variable for instance, such as age, uh, we will be able to look at the relationship between age and our scales and any other metric variables. When we look at our correlation coefficient, it's going to be a number somewhere between negative 1 and positive 1. The closer the number is to positive 1, the closer it is to a what we call a perfect positive correlation. The correlation measures how close to a linear or a straight line relationship the two variables have. If we have a correlation coefficient that's close to negative 1, it's also a very strong relationship and it is a negative relationship so that's telling me when one variable goes up the other one tends to go down. If we have a correlation coefficient that's close to zero then that's telling me that we think that there is no linear relationship. When we're looking at correlations if we are provided with p-values we should always look at the p-values first. Uh, the p-values will give me an indication as to whether I think that my sample correlation is significant, which means that do I think that when I look at the population correlation it is non-zero, so there is actually a correlation present in the population. So here's some graphs which give us a couple of examples just so we can try and visualize these correlations. So in the top left we have perfect positive correlation, so you can imagine we've got two metric variables on our axes and we can see that our points line up in a perfect straight line. This is pretty unlikely. For most of our data we would not expect to see this. Next one along, uh, high positive correlation. So this is a 0.9 and we can see there's a very clear positive relationship there. So as one, uh, one variable increases, the other variable also tends to increase. It's very important with our language that you're using that we talk about how it tends to increase doesn't guarantee an increase. When one variable is getting bigger, that doesn't guarantee that all the measurements for the other one are getting bigger, but it does indicate that they tend to. So on average they are getting bigger. doesn't mean every single one will be. Uh, in our top right we've got a correlation of 0.3, and so we can see some sort of positive relationship there. The points are pretty spread out, it's quite a weak relationship. Uh, but it certainly looks like there is something there. The bottom left we've got uh, perfect negative correlations, so it's negative 1, and again points in a perfect straight line this time with a negative correlation, they slope downwards though. Uh, center bottom we've got negative 0.8, so very clear negative relationship, we can definitely see a straight line there, but a little bit more spread in the points. And our final one bottom right correlation of zero, it's just a big ball. So there's no indication of any kind of positive or relation or negative relationship. So one variable gets bigger, has no indication of what tends to happen to the other variable. So quite often we might have a correlation table. Correlation table will show me uh, the correlations between a whole lot of variables. And this is particularly common when you are presented with uh, scale items, but you may also have other variables in there as well. Uh, we may also have another matching table of p-values. If we had a matching table of p-values, we'd start by identifying the statistically significant ones, then we would look at our table of correlations. In this case we're just going to look at the correlations. And I've got a bullet point there just reminding us of the our wording, so tend to. As one variable increases or decreases, the other one tends to do something. Doesn't always, 
I'm not saying that it, it has to, but it tends to. So when we look at this table, we'll notice that there's no values in the right above the diagonal. It's on the right hand side above the diagonal. This is because a correlation is reversible. So correlation between one variable and the other doesn't matter which way around we think about them. So those blank that blank space, uh, if we were to fill it in, it would just be a mirror of the ones that we see. The second thing we notice is that down the diagonal, all of the figures are 1. This is because if a variable, if we tried to calculate the correlation between a variable and itself, it's perfectly correlated to itself. It has the exact same set of figures uh, both times, so it's perfectly correlated. So we can just ignore that. So now what we want to do is we want to look for the values that are either closest to positive 1 or negative 1. On this table we can see that there is no figures that are very strong. So 0 0.8, 0 0.9, negative 0.8, negative 0.9, there's no very strong relationships. The biggest one that we can see on here is 0.67. We can see it's positive. So that would indicate that as one of these variables, so ability to comprehend verbal instructions increases, then the ability to convey information verbally also tends to increase. And this doesn't really surprise us. We'd, we'd expect that to happen. Um, we can then look for some of our other slightly larger ones and we can see we've got a few that are around about the 0.4 or the negative 0.4. So we would tend to call these moderate correlations. They're not super strong, but they're also a reasonable way from zero. So there's a little bit of a relationship there. So if we have a look at this one here, the negative 0.410, that tells me about the relationship between ego strength and proneness to guilt. It's negative, so it's saying that as, as someone's ego strength increases, their proneness to guilt tends to decrease. Underneath it, the 0.48, we can see ego strength is also related to the degree to which the subject is relaxed. One other thing we might notice with uh, these ones that I've highlighted is that it looks like there's two kind of clusters. So we have this first cluster where we've got these interrelationships between ego and guilt and being relaxed. So this looks like it could be somehow related to some sort of personality trait. A little bit later on when we are talking about factor analysis, uh, we we'll look more closely at the idea that when we've got uh, inter intercorrelated items out of a multi-item scale, sometimes these might actually group together into some sort of uh, underlying trait or some sort of underlying uh, measurement. So with these, these three that I've circled, we can see that there is definitely interconnection between all three of them. And they're, they're all about some sort of personality trait. It's maybe hard to see exactly what it is, uh, but it certainly looks like there's some linking there. The other three, so these two and this one, also seem to be all interconnected to one another. So we can see uh, moderate correlations between each of them. And when we look at what each of them are, all, all of them are measuring something related to verbal communication. So again, there could be some sort of underlying trait that's being reflected in all three of these, which relates to someone's verbal communication skills. One final thing that we need to consider, uh, and this is a very important one, is that when we see correlations, even if they're strong correlations, uh, this does not mean causation. So this is very important. Just because we're seeing a connection or association, uh, and I mean I have been using the word relationship, doesn't mean that one of the variables is causing 
the change in the other. We'll often see uh, reporting in the media, um, particularly sensationalist reporting, where they will have found a correlation. Maybe they've seen a study that an academic has done, they've seen the correlation, and they'll start talking about how broccoli causes blindness or cancer or they will start using the word causes. Something causes something. When we see a correlation, we can't conclude causation. This means when we are writing uh, recommendations, writing reports, that we don't get too carried away with these relationships. Uh, they may be causally related, but the correlation by itself does not confirm that. So if we uh, have a look at what Professor Homer Simpson has to say about correlation, uh, here's a particularly good example about the Bear Patrol, and uh, Lisa has the rock that she says keeps away tigers, and Homer says, how does it work? Uh, and she said, well, it doesn't work, it's just a stupid rock. Um, but you don't see any tigers around, do you? So what she's done there is she's tried to uh, somewhat sarcastically uh, show demonstrate that even though there's this correlation, there's no tigers, there's a rock, doesn't mean there's any sort of causal, a causal relationship happening there. This has been a Swinburne production.